Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Let's all stand and we'll open our service in prayer. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for those of us, those of us, those of you joining us online. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. We ask your blessing upon our service today. Bless those that are on their way and those that are in the back. Just uh, give us a great day of worship. Help us to magnify your name today. Bless your word. Bless everything that's going on in the back with the young people and the teaching and the nursery workers. Bless the fellowship that goes on, uh, even as the nursery workers watch the kids. And um, bless our fellowship. And Father, we're so grateful that we can name the name of Christ that we can know you, that we have our sins forgiven. Help us to faithfully take your word out and share it to others and preach the gospel. And Father, if you give us another day, help us to be faithful to you. But for today, help us to magnify your name together. And we ask you all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please remain standing. Let's check our hymnals. We'll open up to him 161. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Him 161. <laughs> Just one announcement today, uh, just to keep in mind, September 1st through the 4th, that's Monday through Wednesday in September, for our evangelist meetings with Morris Gleiser, uh, mark it in your calendar, September 1st through the 4th. This time, I'll have the usher come forward as we take our general offering. Let's bow for the offering, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for your blessings, Lord. We thank you for everything that you've done for this church, Lord, over 30-plus years, Lord. We thank that you uh, have uh, met all of our needs. We thank you that uh, you have made, made us wise in the distribution of those funds, Lord. And keep it so, Lord. We ask this in your precious name. Amen.
you, Jane, very much. Yuanda, we are praying for you. you please keep Yuanda Young in prayer. It's good to have you here today. Uh, for funeral information for Yuanda's husband, Delbert Young, pray for her, for his family. Um, the funeral is going to be on April 27th uh, at the Monumental Baptist Church, Locust Street in Philadelphia. Uh, that's at 11 a.m. I think that's a Saturday, right? April 27th. Uh, and there's going to be a viewing, I think, from, an, from 9 to 11. And then there's also going to be a viewing on Friday, the night before that, from 6 to 8 p.m. That's April 26th at the Terry Funeral Home Chapel. That's on Haverford Avenue in, uh, in Philadelphia. I tried to print up that, that flyer that you gave and my computer got all messed up, so I'm going to still try and print that up and put that on the back table. But anyone that wants that information, I'll be glad to give that to you. But please keep you on and her family in prayer. Um, we love you. All right, let's open our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And then when you go there, let's look at chapter 3 because I'm not reading chapter 2. That is the first time I've ever done that, isn't it? <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, and let's stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read the first nine verses of Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, the first nine verses, and when I'm finished reading that, I'll ask you to remain standing for prayer. Philippians chapter 3, and beginning in verse 1. We had a blessed prayer meeting, uh, mostly online on Wednesday. We had, I think, three or four people here. Uh, but I've been very encouraged. It's been such a blessing to have Zoom available. Uh, some people that are shut-ins were able to be a part of it. And, uh, man, we've had such a great attendance. People are able to participate. And, and we're, you know, it's, it's a challenge to have Zoom and live uh, initially when we're calling for a vote. Um, you know, I, it used to be I'd say all those in favor say aye, aye, all those opposed, but it takes forever for the eyes to trickle down, you know, <laughs> and so I've had to stop because I'm already saying all those opposed and people are still saying aye, uh, but it's a blessing. And uh, so thank you, folks. Uh, no, no, you know, we voted on the budget. The budget's first quarter is very easy and um, it was a blessing. So if anybody wants, there's the financial reports on the back table. Uh, and, and it's really there for anybody to see. We, uh, whether you're a member or not, uh, you know, it's it's we're, we try to be accountable there. So anyone's welcome to see that. The pastor's report was verbal, and if you would like me to give that to you in the back, uh, you know, just give me five ten. No, I'm not going to do that. All right, Philippians chapter three, beginning of verse one. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous. But for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh, that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of which is of God by faith. May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer. 
Father, we come, we come before you right now, and we want to lift up our sister Yuanda and just ask you to please minister to her and to her family. Father, we thank you that your grace is available. We thank you that you know all things, and just pray, Father, that you would give her a calm and a peace and just help her as she tries to navigate mm-hmm. through these difficult times, these deep waters, these confusing times, and just uh, just give Yuanda a sense of your presence. Uphold her with your spirit. Guide her. Help her to know which way to go and decisions that need to be made. And I just pray, Father, that you would sustain her. And again, assure her of your presence. Minister to Delbert's family and uh, the children, Lord, we just, uh, and the grandkids, we just ask you to, to minister, Father, and be glorified through this situation and in the, in the on- oncoming weeks and months. Show yourself strong. And Lord, I pray for today as we open your word. I pray that you would guide us in the scriptures. Help us to be students of your word. Help us to have our minds and our hearts open to the scriptures. That we might understand what Paul is saying and that the light of the glorious gospel of truth would shine in unto us, that those that have not had their eyes open to the truth of the gospel, the simplicity of salvation, that you would illuminate hearts, make things clear, and bring people to salvation, that those who have been trusting in religion or works, would have their minds open and fall at the foot of the cross and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. The Father will thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, let's open up to him 115. Love lifted me, M one one five. I was sinking deep within him on the peaceful shore, very deep he slain within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits its soul's best song. Faithful loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, on the last, souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, fill us his will obey. He's your savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Amen. All 
All right, let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. And today we are going to hear uh, Paul's testimony. He is going to share some things as he... Uh, we, we, we pick up with the con- from the context of uh, last week. And uh, last week we, we began chapter 1 in a, his exhortation, mainly verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. All warning them about one group of people, the Judaizers. Just to back up uh, about last week, we mentioned that in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, the Bible says certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. By the way, notice in that verse, it doesn't say certain brethren, it says certain men. So this doesn't even call them Christians. There were certain men which came down from Judea and taught the brethren. So these were people that weren't even given the the title of Christians that were coming down and teaching Christians that unless you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you can't be saved. This was a serious doctrinal error. And then... So they, they gathered the apostles together and they before the church they, they wrestled with this issue. This was a serious doctrine. And then when they concluded this was a heresy, this is a false teaching, you don't add anything to the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. And no, you don't add circumcision. You don't add anything. The law doesn't save anyone. And so they concluded that. And, uh, and then they, they went on their way. And so, Paul is now, uh, as he says this, he says, he says we are the circumcision. Uh, and that was something that the Judaizers, they called themselves the circumcision. They were very proud of this, you know, their roots in Judaism. The Jews prided themselves in, in we are the circumcision. That's the token of the Abrahamic covenant. And they were trying to bring saved people, Christians, back under the law. And they, you know, they, were, they prided themselves, and Paul wouldn't even call them that. He, he called them the concision. He said, we are the circumcision, uh, which worship God in spirit and in choice, uh, and, and, and in spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus. We're not, we're not rejoicing in the Old Testament law. In Judaism, we are now free in Christ. And we have no confidence in the flesh. That's what they were boasting in the law. And now he, look at verse 4. Here's where we pick up. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh. He's talking about the Judaizers. He says, I more. You want It's like he's kind of getting foolish here for a little bit. He's saying, You want to have a little boasting game here, you Judaizers? He says, you want to start boasting about in the flesh? Let me tell you my credentials. Let me tell you what I used to boast in. And so he is going to um, talk about something. But I want to back up for a minute. Because uh, not only back then, but even today, people have a problem distinguishing between things between truth and error back here the problem was dis- distinguishing between what is righteous and what is unrighteous now there's always been that problem in fact in Isaiah's time in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 he said woe unto them that call go- evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. God says, woe unto you when you can't discern the good from the evil. Think about it, the bitter for the sweet. When somebody can't, even, when somebody says something that's sweet is bitter, and, and what's bitter is sweet, when you can't even discern, when, when darkness, you call darkness light, that is pretty bad. We live in that time, don't we? We live in that time where people can't discern between truth and error. 
Now they say, this is my truth, which is not truth at all. Um, people now say, well, this is, this is how I identify. And so even male and female now, which this would have blown my mind. When I was in high school, we never wrestled with, you, you know, you're a boy, you're a girl. And, and, and now you, you can't even say things that are just clearly things that were distinguishable before. Well, in Paul's day, the issue was, how does somebody become righteous in God's eyes? And even Paul changed his opinion about that. Even Paul used to, used to think a certain thing, the, you know, being a Jewish person, he thought that all the things spelled out in the Torah, Torah observations, that's what made someone righteous. And he followed it vigorously. And then he met Jesus Christ. And his whole opinion changed. And now he's confronted with the Judaizers who, ha who embrace his old opinion about what makes someone righteous in God's eyes. And he's facing this. And so now he begins to play a game with them. And he says, you want to play the righteous game? Let me tell you, because you're boasting in the flesh. That's, and that's what he used to do. So you want to talk about who has confidence in the flesh? I can beat you in that game. So he begins in a, kind of a foolishness, but this is the way he used to be. So he begins to tell you his credentials, the things he used to rejoice in. So look at verse 3, or verse 3 and 4 is when he says this. We are the circumcision which worship, worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, have no confidence in the flesh. And he says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man think other, uh, any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Uh, and this is where uh, we just point out that the token was circumcision. It had become the, the token had become the substance. In other words, when you go back into uh, the scriptures in, um, in Genesis 17, verses 3 through 14, God, entered, God communicated that circumcision was going to be a sign of his covenant with Israel. And he, and he laid it out. He said, now you're, this is what you're supposed to do. And it's a reflection that you're in a covenant relationship. Over the years, that token became the very substance itself. And so in the New Testament now, you had a major problem with this whole thing of circ circumcision. Listen to how Paul described it in Galatians chapter 5. Here, here was the problem. Christ came and fulfilled the righteousness of the law. And here's what he said in Galatians chapter 5, a couple verses here, verse 3, 4, and then verse 10. Verse 3 he said, For I testify again, to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ, and then in verse 4 he says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. He's saying, okay, you want to get to God by doing the law? You've got to do the whole thing. He, now he understood, he had misunderstood the law also. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, he articulated it this way. Now, this is after he came to Christ. He said, What things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, which was him, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The purpose of the law is not to bring us into a right relationship with God. It's to condemn us. I also, for many years, thought the purpose of the commandments was to to try to get us right with God. And many of you maybe too. You thought, okay, I'm going to try to keep the law, obey the commandments, and hopefully my good will outweigh the bad. In fact, in verse 10 of Galatians 5, he says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if you want to get to heaven... By doing the law, 
all the things in the, the Ten Commandments. And in fact, the Jew, one of the Jews counted, or many of them have, there's over 300 commandments in the law. You want to get to heaven by doing the law, you've got to do the whole thing. Who can do that? No one. So now Paul begins to boast. And this was, his, uh, this was like his uh, rap sheet. This is what he would um, boast in. And he, he's, what he's doing is he's saying, you Judaizers, you have confidence in the flesh? I can beat you at that game. So let's look at these, this list. This is a pretty important list. It's, again, his credentials. Look at verse 5. Circumcise the eighth day. In other words, he is saying it was required of every Hebrew boy that, and this was in the Old Testament, that on the eighth day they were circumcised as a sign of the covenant. And the Judaizers insisted that the Gentiles, so if you were an adult and you got saved and you were a Gentile, so you weren't circumcised, they said, okay, you got to, in order now, you're a Christian, but because we're Judaizers, you got to be circumcised in order to be saved. Clearly, this, it was a new thing. In keeping with Genesis chapter 17. Well, Paul's saying, listen, I was brought up as a Jewish person. And so, you know, I uh, was circumcised the eighth day as a Hebrew boy. And then of the stock of Israel. This is a, um, or of the, the word stock is also translated in the King James as the family, the kindred, or the nation, uh, the stock of Israel. And, and by, by the way, let me stop for a minute and say something about Paul's name, or because he his name is Saul. In um, in in the beginning of Acts, his name is Saul. And some have said, in fact, I think I said this for for many years when I first got saved, that uh, some have understood this that when Saul got saved, he became Paul. Like remember. Um, Remember, Abram, changes, God changed his name to Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. And some have said that when Saul got saved, he became Paul. But you will not find that in Scripture. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name. And there is clearly no, you will not find anywhere in Scripture where it was he was Saul until he got saved and then he was Paul. It was just Saul was his Hebrew name. He was named after King Saul. And when he was in Jerusalem, he used Saul because there were Jews there. In fact, if you look, the shift from Saul to Paul happens in Acts as soon as he sets off in his missionary journeys and leaves Jerusalem because he's going to go out into the Gentile world. And in fact, it says in Acts 13, 9, but Saul, who was also called Paul, was filled with the Spirit. And it goes on. And, and that's all the difference it is, is. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Gentile name. But it's not the difference is that when he got saved, that's nowhere in Scripture. In fact, Jesus did not, you know, rename him. It was Luke who says the name simply understanding that. So it says here, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, this was a big deal to the Jewish people. Not only was he of the stock or of the people of Israel, so he was born a Hebrew child, but he was of the elite tribe of Benjamin. He could trace his origins to the tribe of Benjamin, which was a favored tribe, which came from the namesake of king, the first king of Israel, which was Saul, which the tribe of which tribe was blessed of Moses, and I quote from Deuteronomy 33 and verse 12, Saul and that tribe, it was the beloved of the Lord whom the Lord loves, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. There was something very special about Benjamin, and in whose territory, uh, that is of Benjamin, sat the holy city itself. And that tribe also was notable because they alone joined Judah in loyalty to the Davidic covenant. And so that was, you know, that was a kind of a feather in the cap of anyone that was from the tribe of Benjamin. And so he's, he's, these were the things that 
made him, at least before, this is all, remember, he's talking about having confidence in the flesh. So, when he came to Christ, this all changed. But prior to his coming to Christ, these were feathers in his cap. You can imagine him as a Pharisee, you know, among the Pharisees and others, is these are things that he would have boasted about. These were a big deal in his ledger. <laughs> and this, then this would, this would lead into the next one. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, to understand the context back then, you had uh, the Jews and Hebrews who became Hellenized. That is, they kind of allowed themselves to be swallowed up in the Greek culture. And if you hear about Hellenistic Jews, that is, they were Jews that came in and then learned the Greek and learned the ways and the customs and kind of left their Hebrew heritage behind. But when he says this, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, uh, they held on to their old tongue, their old education, and the customs of their fathers, uh, you know, and, and then, so they viewed themselves as superior to the Grecians uh, or the Hellenistic Jews and uh, who, who were more easily assimilated into that, to the heathens around them. You know, they, they held on to that heritage. And then he said, uh, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Now I want to read to you from some of the in the book of Acts where we learn uh, certain things about Paul's relationship to the law. And you don't need to turn here, but in Acts chapter 23 and verse 6, this is a scenario that Paul found himself in and he took advantage of the fact that he was a Pharisee. He was in this situation where there was about ready to be a, a, or some pressure against him which could have actually led to some problems. And he said, but when Paul perceived, this is Acts 23, 6, when Paul perceived that the one part of this mob were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and the hope of and res." and of the hope and resurrection of the dead am I called in question. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. So that there's this scrutinization of Paul, and they're coming against him. And he's like, hmm, I see some Sadducees. Oh, I see some Pharisees. And, and he calls this, he brings up a topic which he knew they were divided which, as a Pharisee, they believed in angels, they believed in resurrection. And so he brought that up, and he got them quibbling among himself so he could kind of escape. So that was very wise on his part. And then in Acts chapter 26, he's standing before King Agrippa. And he says this uh, to King Agrippa. He says, my manner of life, these people um, basically says, I'd be glad to answer for myself. These people which knew me from my youth, uh, I'm trying to pick up in the context here, from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, in other words, the most strictest sect of the, my religion, I lived a Pharisee. So he wasn't just a Pharisee, but he was the strictest sect of Pharisee. And then in Galatians 1.14, speaking of himself, he said, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. So he was so zealous of a Pharisee. Very So when he says, as touching the law, a Pharisee. He was, a, he was so, uh, we would maybe use the word today, legalistic. We would definitely use that term. Uh, and then that leads into the next one. Paul's, Paul's telling you, that he was one of the most radical of radicals. Because we're talking about concerning the flesh. Religious zeal. He's, and again, he's addressing the Judaizers. And he said, concerning zeal, this next statement in Philippians 3. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. I want to read to you some other in, in the book of Acts. 
Stephen. You remember the, the first martyr of the church? It was Stephen. He preached Jesus Christ. Now we're talking before Saul got saved. And it says this, And Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And now Paul's preaching much later, and he's going back to that, and he said, And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I, Paul says, was also standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So he was overseeing Stephen's own martyrdom. That's how zealous he was about persecuting the church. Remember back when Jesus was on the earth? He warned his disciples in the early days. He said, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will thinketh that he doeth God's service. That was Saul. Saul was so zealous in his Judaism that he persecuted anyone that stood for Jesus Christ, thinking he was doing God's service. So he was, he was one of those that was, he was of the circumcision, zealous to persecute anyone that was identified with Jesus Christ. Now look at this last mark that Paul says he bore so proudly. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. Now we need to back up for a minute. Um, because this would almost sound like when you understand what Paul teaches now, now that he's saved, about the law, uh, you might think this would contradict what he's talking about. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless? Wait a minute, I thought, I thought you didn't get saved by the righteousness of the law. Right? Remember, for by works are you saved, or for by faith are you saved through grace? That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works? No, let's remember. Paul is talking about confidence in the flesh. He's talking about how he used to think. He's talking about Torah observation. You know, what he, the, the Pharisees. Remember what the Pharisees were all about? external following of the law. The best way to describe how Paul used to think as a Pharisee is to listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 25. Listen to this. Here were Jesus' own words condemning the Pharisees, hence condemning Paul, Saul himself or Paul. Matthew 23, 23 and following, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Paying tithe was paying 10%, giving the first fruits. And you know what mint and anise and cumin is? It's seasonings like... I mean, can you imagine being so picky that you take your seasonings and you give the first portion to God? I mean, that's, that's talk, talk about being picky. Or my, my, uh, my father-in-law would say persnickety. You ever hear that word? Any of you use that word in conversations, persnickety? Sometimes? Okay. I only did once my father-in-law, persnickety. Like, oh, well, let's use some paprika. Oh, wait, we got to give part to God. You know, and I mean, that's detailed. They, they would do that. They'd pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and yet they omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides. You strain at a gnat. Apparently, a gnat is an unclean animal. So they, and apparently, like, if they're having soup, they would be so persnickety about eating an unclean animal that they would strain a gnat out of their soup. But they would swallow a camel. Now, I don't think they really swallowed a camel, but, 
you know, the idea is they'd be so picky about little things, but then they'd, they'd ignore very big things. Woe unto you, Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You may clean the outside of the cup and the platter. See, they were all about how things looked. Remember, they'd pray big prayers in public so people could see them. It was all about how it looked, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So what Paul is talking about when he says, when he says concerning zeal, persecuting, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, he was talking about Torah observations, observable conduct, the Pharisaic interpretation of the law. Which was So he's not talking about righteousness in the context of God's character or being in right standing with God. He's talking about the Sabbath observations as they had it, food laws, ritual cleansings, all those external things. That's what he was talking about. What makes this kind of righteousness worthless? is that it generates confidence in the flesh. And Paul was saying, I beat you. I win. And then in verse 7 through 9, he says now, but what things were gained to me? All that stuff I used to boast in, those I counted loss for Christ. Torah observations, worthless. It's like he's taking all that stuff that he used to trust in and he's casting it aside. It's worthless. I'm no longer trusting in any of that. And now it's Jesus Christ and Him alone. For me, I grew up under a sacramental system where I was trusting in the sacraments. Confession, Holy Eucharist. I mean, we had sacramental system where, you know, where it would meritorious grace. And I remember I used to, you know, have you had your confirmation yet? First Holy Communion. I, I mean, I did all that stuff. I was trusting in that. And then I heard the gospel, the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so my boast would be all those sacramental things. And when I got saved... I cast them aside and trusted Jesus Christ and Him alone. What about you? What's going to get you to heaven? What are you trusting in? You see, it's not what Jesus did and part what I did. If you're trusting in your baptismal certificate or your baptism or your confirmation, or any religious deed, you're not trusting in Jesus Christ alone. You're putting part of your confidence in your flesh and part in God, and that's not what gets you to heaven. It's His deeds, the finished work of Jesus Christ, and nothing else. It's His righteousness, and that alone. In fact, Paul said in verse 8, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. See, there's only one thing that will make you righteous with God, and it's Jesus Christ and His deeds, not your deeds. It's so simple. The devil makes things so complicated, so complicated. The devil has gotten so crafty. When I witness to my dear friends from the religion I grew up in, they have gotten so crafty in you know, you know, describing the difference between their righteousness and, and God's righteousness. They have um, 
You know, they have something called condign merit versus congruous merit, infused righteousness versus um, imputed righteousness, and they, they just make it so muddy. You know, in, in the same way that, well, you know, are you male or female? It's like, it, it's, it's, they make it confusing. Whereas, and so truth, it's not truth and error anymore. They make it, they, they, they move away from light and darkness. I imagined it like this, you know, because when things, when, when it's not black and white, when it's not truth and error, when it's, you know, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, they exchange bitterness for sweet. Imagine this someday, that I'm going out to buy some food and I can't find any money, so I take out a piece of paper and I draw a picture of Benjamin Franklin. And I put on there the number 100. And I go to the store and I get a lot of food and I say, Here, here's, here's, here's $100. And the, the person at the register says, um, sorry, sir, that's not a $100 bill. I say, yes, it is. It's got a picture of Ben Franklin. It says $100. That's my $100 bill. Sir, that is not $100. I identify that as $100. You have to accept that as $100. No, sir, that, wait a minute. I am offended if you don't accept that as a $100 bill. Can you imagine how ridiculous this world would get if all of a sudden now we had to accept anybody's version of a $100 bill? Can you imagine what would happen to our economy? Honestly. If a $100 bill, what, what is a legitimate $100 bill, was no longer a legitimate $100 bill, if anybody could make up a $100 bill, our economy would collapse. Would it not? If, if a legitimate $100 bill could no longer be accepted as a legitimate $100 bill. And now, anybody's one, we'd, we'd all monopoly, I mean, monopoly money would now be fair game. And anybody could draw a $100 bill and it would be accepted. Can you imagine how ridiculous that would be? Well, if what God calls righteousness is no longer righteousness, and anybody can say, God, I call this righteous, that's not the way it's going to be, folks. In fact, I close with this. In fact, turn here, Matthew chapter 7. Because, folks, this is what God says is going to happen. Matthew chapter 7. This is going to be a very sad day. Matthew chapter 7. Somebody move the verse on me. <laughs> Not every, okay. Wait a minute. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into. Somebody look that up for me. What is it? 21. Verse 21. There it is. Just poof, appeared there. All right. Not Jesus is speaking here. Matthew 7, 30, uh, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now look at verse 21. Many will say to me in that day, this is going to happen. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Lord, I've done all these things in your name. This is judgment day. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are people that did not submit to God's righteousness. They were bringing their own righteousness to God. And on that day, they're going to find out that they never, that they're, these are going to be people that brought their own righteousness 
They did not, they ignored God's righteousness. They never responded to the gospel in believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ. They were never born again. And it's going to be a sad day. Lord, I did, I was a Christian. I followed a Christian denomination. But they never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. That is so tragic. So I want to ask you something. Have you given up hope in all those religious things, your baptism, and have you trusted Jesus Christ alone? It is so important that you are born again the Bible way. Make sure that you're born again. Let's pray. Father, we ask you today as we dismiss our service that for anyone that is not made sure that they are on their way to heaven, that they would make sure today that they are saved the Bible way, that they would stop trusting in the flesh, even as Paul stopped trusting in his flesh. He gave up all those credentials and all those things that he, that he touted and that he trusted in, all those religious things. And he trusted and put his confidence in Jesus Christ and him alone. Father, I pray that folks would do that today. We pray in Jesus' name. Please keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for a few minutes here. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what you just heard. Jesus Christ came to die for sinners. And when he hung on that cross, he was paying for your sins. The full price. He died on the cross. The Bible says that God the Father made him to be sin for you. And what he did on the cross was full payment for your sins. You don't need to do anything. In fact, you can't do anything. Going to church, whether it's the sacraments or some you know, orthodox, your religious ordinances or whatever church things that they tell you to do, your baptism, none of that, those deeds cannot in any way suffice the punishment that you deserve. Jesus paid it all. And all you need to do, metaphorically, is just kneel at the cross, cry out to God to save you. By faith, you're doing this. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can do that right now in your seat. Stop trusting in your religion. Stop trusting in your baptism or whatever it is. Do what Paul did. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. He paid your penalty. You need to simply come to Him in faith. Believe on Him. Have you done that? Now, if you've already done that, if you've somewhere, anywhere, it doesn't matter where you're at. You don't need to be in a church. You get down on your knees. In fact, you don't even need to be on your knees because the key is your heart. But right now, in simple faith, if you would do, just, just cry out to God. You don't need to pray out loud. But if you just silently said, Dear God, I am a sinner. Please save me. That was the example of the, the, the sinner that went into the temple to pray. That's all he did. He just asked God for mercy. Father, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, that man went down to his house justified. And if you would ask God right now in your heart, just cry out and ask him to save you. If you've not already done that, if you did that today, just right now, the Bible says, whosoever calls on the Lord, God will save you. Will you do that right now if you need to? Just ask him to save you. Lord, save me. Now, if you did that, and you just really meant that, it'd be a blessing to me if you shared that with me. It'd be a blessing. But sharing that with me isn't what saves you. Calling on the Lord. Just If you just ask the Lord to save you, and you really meant it, then, then he saves you. Uh, and you don't need to share it with me, but if you would, it would be a blessing. And if you did that, would you let me know? I'd be blessed. I promise you I won't embarrass you. I'll just, you know, however many people raise their hand, I'll just say thank you, and you can put your hand down, and then we'll praise the Lord. I won't mention your name or anything, but it would let me know, and it'd be a blessing. So if you did that, and you don't mind sharing, would you just slip your hand up and then put it back down again, and then we'll, we'll move on and close the service. Anybody like that? You did that? 
You don't mind sharing it with me? Just raise your hand. I'm looking all across. Anyone like that? Okay, Father, thank you for this day. I pray for your blessing. Lord, I pray that this simple message of faith in the Savior would, would be driven home uh, to hearts and that if there's anyone here today that hasn't done that, that you would bring them to that point. And if there's folks here that have done that recently, uh, that you would just drive that home in their heart of what they did so they would understand that they are saved and then allow them to grow in their newfound faith. Father, thank you that salvation is free and uh, it's not based on what we do. And I pray that you'd bring people to that point where they no longer trust in the flesh, but in Christ. And we rejoice that your salvation is free and eternal. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and we will close in song.